Thanks to the organizers for uh, inviting me over here. Uh, I'll speak about uh, a topic which has some pra practical significance, gradient compression, and a fix to the current uh, number of methods which have been uh, proposed for, for doing this. It turns out that in some sense, the way this is being done at the moment is, is incorrect in some very precise sense. And this variance reduction trick uh, uh, fixes this problem. Here's an abstract this for, for when this uh, becomes online. Here's the motivation. We want to train a supervised machine learning model, uh, which will abstract as a finite sum minimization problem with a regularizer. So there's n maybe data points. In this case, it would be machines, number of machines. So already fi would be loss function associated with the data stored on machine i. And we want to minimize average of these uh, n functions. We, the model is d-dimensional, and we have some uh, sort of a regularizer. So these are the arrows there pointing to what I was saying. Now, the, the baseline method for this is distributed gradient descent, which uh, works like this. Okay? This is distributed proximal gradient descent. So all that you do is this just a funny way of writing on proximal gradient descent with writing the gradient as average of these local gradients. There's nothing going on here. Let's see how this works. Uh, so the way this works is that in the, in, in the case of three machines, you start uh, with sending the problem to these machines, to distribute the problem. So the first function goes to the first machine, and the regularizer also goes there. Second function goes to the second machine, and the regularizer goes there, and so on and so forth. And then also every machine will maintain a local copy of, of the model, xk, and some iterative process will happen here. So the way uh, this is in practice very often implemented is through parameter server setup. So what's going on, every machine computes gradient based on the local data. So this is the gradient of f1 for machine 1, gradient of two, f2 for machine f2, and so on. Then these gradients are communicated to the parameter server. And this is the expensive part because communication is very expensive. Now the parameter server is uh, just doing very simple averaging in order to compute the full gradient. So this is the full gradient. And then the full gradient is uh, sent back. There's another communi communication going on to the machines. Now everybody knows the gradient, so everybody can do the prox gradient descent step. Okay? So this is, this is a funny way of writing down uh, gradient descent or proximal gradient descent in a distributed setup. So, so the difficulty with this is the communication part. If D is large, if we optimizing over this RD over huge models, then we're sending a lot of data, all of these updates, d-dimensional vectors, and we'd like to uh, avoid this if that's possible. So what do we do? Well, there's two strategies how to deal with this. Either we send these d-dimensional vectors but then we do something more than gradient step on each node in the hope that if we do something much more massive, uh, a, a tougher computation, then this will lead to less iterations, which means less uh, uh, communications. So that's one hope. And then there's this orthogonal point of view. Simply uh, do whatever you want to do. Do even gradient descent, just as we've done, but compress what you're going to send. Okay, and this is... Uh, the setup in which uh, this talk is, is set. So we'll be compressing the gradients, and a compression operator is something like this. It's a randomized mapping, which we'll call C, from RD to RD, and it should have some properties in order to be useful. The first property would be, once you compress, it's still d-dimensional vector. This is only because we want to be doing mathematics with this. So we keep the dimension, but it should be easier to communicate. So maybe it's still dense, the dimensional vector, but each entry uh, is quantized. So it's less bits overall. Or maybe it's sparse. So you have sparsification, dithering, sketching, and so on. So we can use different techniques how to implement this uh, uh, compression operator. In order to do theory, we'll be assuming that the compression operator is unbiased. And this will be very useful. The variance is bounded in this very special way. So bounded proportional to the size of whatever we're compressing. So these two things are for the theory. This is, this is for the practice. Now, if this omega factor is large, then uh, that means the variance is, is very big. We're really replacing what we want to be communicating by something which might be very far away from it. 
So you would expect that maybe the number of iterations, the overall number of iterations of the method, if it's well designed, is going to grow. Uh, but as omega grows, maybe there's a chance that uh, the number of bits that you need to communicate uh, goes down. So there's this trade-off, and the question is, is there a sweet spot uh, somewhere in between? Is it optimal to not compress, or it might be optimal to compress uh, to a certain uh, uh, amount? Okay, so here's how the method works with compression. We'll call the gradient descent with compressed gradients. We still compute a gradient. Now this could be also stochastic gradients. I'm really simplifying. So if, if each node contains so many data, so much data that compute, computation of a single gradient is expensive, this could be stochastic gradient. So here is a gradient. We don't want to communicate this. We're going to compress, and we communicate the compressed gradients. The same thing happens as before. The parameter server averages these, uh, these uh, compressed gradients, and everything proceeds exactly as before. Okay? So now, this looks like a perfectly fine algorithm. Uh, this is how it looks like. And if you look at this, we clearly see that from the uh, second property of C, we see that this is still unbiased estimate of the gradient. Okay? So this is just a very quick computation. Expectation of GK is expectation of this finite average. You exchange expectation, the average, and now you use the second property. You get the average of the gradients as the gradient. Yes? Uh, in the upper left equation, after compression, it gets smaller. How does it match the original x? So after compression, it doesn't become smaller. It's the same dimension. It's just less bits. OK. OK? So, so the compression operator goes from RD to RD. OK? This is because we. We want to fix this in order for the mathematics to be, to be, to, to be doable. But this could be super sparse vector. So, so, so it could really map to some subspace. We, we allow that. OK. So we go back. Good. So you had unbiasedness. But the problem with this algorithm is that it introduces variance into what otherwise uh, was uh, a method without any variance. It was gray in the scent. It's not a stochastic method at all. So everything was fine about this. So one comment before I go and, and, and explain these two things. In the case when there's no regularizer and for some very special compression operator, this is the famous QSGD algorithm, quantized SGD algorithm of Alistair and co-authors. So once you introduce the compression operator, you turn a perfectly fine gradient descent algorithm into SGD or proximal SGD. Now proximal SGD is not as good as gradient descent if you actually can do gradient descent. So one thing that... Uh, uh, SGD doesn't do, it cannot really solve the problem to optimality with the linear rate unless the stochastic gradients at the optimum are all the same. Okay, so, th so there's this, this, this property. So the way to still converge to the solution is simply by decreasing step sizes and then you kill the linear convergence rate. Okay? So suddenly we have an algorithm but we cannot converge linearly even if we have perfectly fine F, strongly convex and smooth. Is this necessary? Second problem, this will not really work for regularized problems. So the literature on compressed gradient methods uh, does not really consider uh, regularization. Now we know in optimization we'd like to regularize and we want to converge fast. So how, how to fix this? This is really the motivation uh, for this talk. Good. So the very quick answer for those who are not uh, super patient is that this is the way to do it. So don't compress the gradient. Compress the difference between a gradient and some other vector, auxiliar vector, that you'll maintain on each node. It's going to be a different vector on each node. And then add to this thing uh, that maintain vector, average over all the nodes, and this should be the gradient estimator. If you do this, and if you maintain, if you update these HIK vectors in a correct way, then you will not have those problems that I mentioned before. On strongly convex smooth problems, this will converge linearly to the solution. It will work with any uh, convex regularizer, and so on and so forth. Okay? So this is variance reduction for uh, gradient compression. Now, some intuition into this. The way these uh, vectors will be designed is that they will converge to the gradient of Fi at the optimum. Okay? Now, if that is happens and, and the method actually works, then what you're compressing is converging to zero. So you're compressing something that is smaller and smaller, and that is the reason why you don't have to decrease step sizes because the vector itself goes to zero. So you can fix the step size. You don't have to ever de decrease it. 
And since you can fix the step size, you can retain a linear convergence rate. Okay? Uh, so there's four papers on this topic out there that I know of. The first one, and that's what I'm going to spend the rest of uh, the talk on, is the SEGA algorithm, which appeared in last year's NIPS. And this one tackles the problem for very special n, which is n is equal to 1. There's no distributed setup at all. So even in the case when n is equal to 1, you just have one function, but you quantize the gradient, it's not very clear whether you can uh, retain those properties of gradient, as I mentioned, linear convergence to the solution, working with any regularizer. And this was solved, but also for very special compression operators, which are sketching operators. So we just multiply by random matrices. That's it. So what happens here, you have a random projection onto the range space of some random matrix S, and you pre-multiply by certain fixed matrix so that the expectation of this thing is identity. Okay? Because we want to have the unbiasedness property. Once you, once you have this, the method is going to work, and it will have linear convergence rate. Yes? So the centralized server is computing each case, but it doesn't have the H vector? So, so the way you implement it, in fact, is that it will also maintain the average of the HIs. I'm not going into those details, but that can be done. The, 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 uh, that's how it actually would be done if n is bigger than 1. Okay. So if n is equal to 1, we completely lose the motivation of doing distributed optimization because there's no communication necessary, okay? But then uh, there's other motivation for, for why you might want to do something like this, and, and I'll talk about it for the rest of the talk. Now, so this was the first variance reduction method for uh, gradient compression. Then uh, there was this algorithm, Diana, which works directly with a finite uh, sum problem. And, uh, but this one used a very special uh, quantization, uh, even a smaller class than this, ternary quantization. So every entry of the gradient vector gets replaced by one of three values, zero, minus something, or plus something. And it, it, so, so that's why uh, it's called ternary quantization. Okay, so this is the first phase reduction for gradient compression, which works in the distributed setup. Then there's another uh, method, and yet another method. So this Diana method is a generalization of the Diana algorithm to any uh, uh, compression operator. And at the same time, it can also handle finite sum uh, on each node. So you have a finite sum structure, and you only, uh, you only compute stochastic gradients, you only compute a gradient of one function fij at a time, and you can still get linear convergence to the exact solution uh, by just accessing that only. Because there's double uh, variance reduction, one for the compression operator, and the other one for the finite sum structure on each node. Okay. Any questions on this? Yes. So they're all linearly convergent, and then are, like they're strong with convexity and smoothness. Yes. And then they depend differently. And so one way one can think of this is that uh, this is a generalization of this. Okay. Now, the connection between this and, and, and this is not exactly understood, but I believe that a proper way of, of doing the analysis for this would generalize that as well. Okay. And this 99%, there's many more algorithms, so I don't want to go in, in, into it. There's also accelerated variance behind some of these and some other things. Okay. Good. So here are the references for those four methods. And now the rest of the talk is really about the first of these, so we'll remove the N problem. Uh, this was done uh, with uh, my two PhD students, uh, Philip Hanzel and Konstantin Mishenko. And here they are. Good. So now we look at the problem of minimizing f plus r. So f is not finite sum, just a single f. We work in rd. And we assume that f is, is nice. It's L smooth and mu strongly convex. Now we'll assume uh, a slightly non-standard version of smoothness, where we assume that the Hessian of this quadratic upper bound is not just diagonal, but it's any positive semi-definite matrix L. This will be important because we would like to uh, compare uh, the performance of this method, the theoretical complexity, to the best known uh, rates for randomized coordinate set methods, and I explain why. And all of them are analyzed uh, in the setting because then they can become faster. Good. And we'll assume this is co convex and closed regularizer. So here is the idea. You take your gradient and, and you sketch it. So assume you have a new oracle. You don't ever get to see the gradient, but you get to see a random linear transformation of the gradient. And the question is, can you still minimize the function? And the answer is yes. 
Okay? So this is, this is access that you have. You also have access to the, to the matrix S. So not just to the sketch gradient, but you also get access to S. Okay? Every time this is sampled. And this is sampled IID from some distribution. could be any distribution. I'm not assuming any particular random ensemble of matrices. Uh, so for instance, uh, you can think of S as having B columns. You can think of B as a batch size. And, and then the action of S on gradient is, is the following. You have B uh, directional derivatives. So that's the information you're going to get. Okay? Good. So here's some other examples. Gaussian sketch. S could be just a vector. And then you get uh, directional derivative in a random Gaussian direction. Or you can have coordinate sketch where S is just random uh, unit, standard unit basis vector. And then what you have is just uh, i partial derivative. That's the information. So this is, notice this is the information which is used by coordinates and algorithms. Coordinates and algorithms are different from the algorithm I'll describe here, but this is the reason why one might want to compare the theoretical complexity against those, because they have been very well studied already. So why should we bother? First of all, the motivation, we want to understand gradient compression in distributed training, so we better understand it in the n is equal to one case, because even then, in that case, it's not understood. Good. But you could also think of this as a new oracle. Oracle, new first order, stochastic first order oracle, where what you get is, 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 is a gradient sketch. Can you solve the problem in that case? And another uh, motivation is that you realize that the special case of a gradient sketch will be this coordinate sketch. And then you get an algorithm, which will not be coordinate algorithm, but which will use the same information about the gradient. So the question is, which one is better? Okay. So these are all motivation for this work. Good, so this is, the, this is the algorithm. So we know we'll be working with proximal SGD, uh, but we don't know how to generate this GK. So all difficulty lies in generating good estimators GK, which get better and better approximating the gradient at the optimum as the algorithm progresses. Good, so this is why it's called SEGA, Sketch Gradient Estimator, and Sketch Gradient Oracle. So uh, what do we want from this oracle? Uh, from this estimator. So first of all, we want it to be implementable, so something we can actually work with. We want it to be unbiased because this is how essentially all of the algorithms, with very few exceptions, stochastic algorithms are analyzed. And we want this variance to go to zero as the algorithm progresses, and this is where the linear convergence will come from. So how do we do that? So the first idea you may get is the following. This is Ketchan project idea. So you, you, you measure the action of some random matrix onto the gradient. And this is what you measured, the right-hand side. And you know that the gradient satisfied this linear equation. It's a random linear equation. And you know the gradient is a solution of it. But S is not big enough so that this would have only a unique solution. So this has many more solutions than just the gradient. So, and, and you're trying to build estimate of the gradient. Maybe you have a previous guess, HK, of what the gradient looks like. And you believe your guess. So you say, I don't want to perturb it much, but I still am observing reality, and this is what the reality tells me. Okay? It must lie there. So maybe you just project HK onto this uh, linear system. Okay? Sketch and project. And this intuitive uh, idea actually works. So this is how one can do it. And it turns out from HK plus 1 and HK, you can construct GK, which would work. Good. So uh, this is what I already mentioned. Good. Uh, so this is a best approximation problem. Everything is simple. You can write down the solution in a closed form. And what you get is just HK plus a certain random matrix times the difference between the gradient and HK. And from this, you already see the structure of, of the uh, estimator. So we had difference. We're sketching the difference, and we're adding some estimator. It was exactly the structure of the uh, estimators I mentioned before. Good. Let me pause. I'm doing projection onto random subspace. I'm not sure whether interpolation is the right way of thinking of it. So one, one way which is non-trivial uh, of thinking of this is, in fact, this is one step of stochastic gradient descent with unit step size for solving a certain stochastic optimization problem, which I didn't write here. And the solution of the stochastic optimization problem is the gradient. 
Okay? So we're just taking one step of a randomized iterative method towards computing the gradient. So one step is enough to get some information about the gradient so that this whole thing will work if we iterate. Okay, okay good. Uh, so here's the visualization. So we know that the uh, gradient lies in this sketched space, okay, somewhere, but we don't know where. Here's our estimator of the gradient, and we just project. And from this, you can already see that we get closer to the gradient, okay, just because of uh, uh, Pythagoras theorem here, okay? So in some sense, uh, this should work. Good, so there's uh, a number of papers on this topic of sketch and project from various different perspectives. Perspective of matrix inversion, uh, uh, quasi-Newton updates, acceleration, and so on and so forth. I'm including here some references uh, if, if somebody's interested to, to study these, these types of met methods later on. You can extend to convex feasibility and, and so on and so forth, okay? So one issue with the sketch and project iteration is that HK plus one, this projected uh, uh, gradient, will not be unbiased estimator of the gradient, okay? So here is a 2D example of this. So let's say that we're sketching in 2D either the first coordinate vector or the second coordinate vector with uh, some probabilities P1, uh, P2. And uh, so then the first uh, uh, sketch space would be the space which, which is consistent with the first coordinate of the gradient, and second, which is consistent with the second coordinate of the gradient. So the sketch and project with equal probabilities looks like this. Here's the true gradient, which we don't know, but uh, here's our estimator of the gradient, and we just happen to project either on this or on this line, because that's the information we get. Either we know the first partial derivative or the second partial derivative, okay? So, so we know one of these uh, pieces of information. So now what you may want to do, you may want to over project over here, over project over here exactly uh, by the same distance. And then when you take average of these two points, you hit exactly the gradient, okay? Notice that if you don't over project, if you just take average of HK plus one, HK plus one of these two, you will not get unbiasedness. But by over projecting, you will get unbiasedness, okay? So you over project and you get there. Again, this is the difference uh, stuff that you've seen uh, before. Here, uh, this is uh, illustrated with some different probabilities. So again, the same setup, but now we're projecting with different probabilities. We project here with probability one, uh, two thirds, and here probably one third. So here we need to over project by only 50%, and here we over project uh, uh, twice as much. And then when you take the weighted average of these two points, you hit the gradient, okay? So you can see that the uh, if you want to build an unbiased estimator from HK and HK plus one, you have to do some linear co combination and it could be a random linear combination of HK, HK plus one, okay? This can be done in general. And the way, uh, this is one way how you can do it. Uh, this theta K is that over, project fa over projection factor. And if you now look at HK plus one and just plug in from the best approximation uh, uh, problem, the solution, this is how it's going to look like. So we see we're sketching the difference between gradient and our estimate of the gradient, and we add to it the estimate of the gradient, okay? It has exactly the form that I mentioned before. And this is the SEGA estimator. And now the rest of the story is, if you use this estimator, you don't have those issues that I mentioned, this thing will converge with any closed convex regularizer. If the uh, problem is uh, strongly convex and smooth, it will solve, solve it linearly, it will converge to the exact solution. Good, so here's the algorithm. Uh, so first you sketch, then you do sketch and project, and then you do the uh, uh, combination of HK and HK plus one in order to get an unbiasedness, okay? And then you do prox SGD step and repeat, okay? That's all, that's the whole method. So I'll pause here for a second. Yes? When you're in the case when the sketch is just like slightly important. Yeah. Then I was assuming sketch and project just is literally like zero and out everything except for that coordinate. This that S could be it? anything. Could be absolutely any matrix. Yeah, what I'm saying just to, as an example. Okay. One thing you're going to select the coordinate. Yeah. Yeah. In that case, is, is your projection step is just you get a gradient where you zero out everything except that coordinate. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And then I got confused like, why would that be on, not unbiased? It's not unbiased. That's why you have to over project. Okay. That's why you have to go over that line. 
Yeah. Because of the HK plus one will not be unbiased. But once you combine HK plus one HK with the right uh, probabilities, as, as I mentioned here in this picture, yeah. okay, once you do this, so this is not going to be unbiased, this is not going to be unbiased, but if you over project, over project, and you take the uh, average with the right probabilities, you get unbiased estimate of the gradient. So that's all, okay? Okay, good. So this is the algorithm. Uh, now there's other variants that we talk about in this paper, which I will not really talk about much here. So this is a standard SEGA, but we can also work with bias SEGA, which doesn't uh, correct for uh, bias and just uses as the estimator HK plus one. But we don't have any analysis of this. You can work with subspace SEGA, which uses this following very simple uh, idea. If the function is of this form, then we know that the gradient lies in the range space of a transpose. And maybe the space is much smaller than the original dimension of the space. That means you have some information, prior information from the structure about where the gradient lies. And we're trying to learn the gradient, so let's use the information. So when we do the sketch and project, we include another constraint which says H is in the space. It turns out, if you design these probabilities and sketches correctly, you can improve by the factor of the ratio between the dimension of this latent uh, small subspace and the original space. Okay, that is possible. Good, and we also have axillary SEGA in some very special case without a regularizer for coordinate sketches. Good, so here is the general theorem. And the general theorem that something converges linearly, okay? Uh, and uh, what is mu? Mu is just strong convexity constant. Gamma is just the step size. And because this is a theorem which works for any sketches, the step size selection rule looks complicated. So I'm not going to go there and try to put some intuition into this. But the intuition is this is the right way of doing it. If you specialize to some very particular sketches, you really get meaningful quantities and meaningful step sizes. And here we have a Lyapunov function, which is a combination of the distance between HK, H, XK and the solution because we want to convert to the solution, but also HK minus the gradient at the optimum, okay? And, and you should expect something like this because we're learning the gradients at the optimum at the same time. This is what allows us to get uh, variance reduction. Okay. Good, so let me pause here again. So presumably you know these, you're gonna do better. If, if we know, whatever, gamma, mu, alpha, beta. Right, so, so this is generic result which holds for any sketches, and now you could try to optimize for the sketches, for instance. No, There's many things you could no, do. Honestly, presumably if you do these, you'll do better, hopefully. What if you don't know these? Well, if you, these? if you don't know uh, mu, for instance, then it would be difficult to, to satisfy this, okay? Right, so I'm wondering okay, so but, but there are some cases where, 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 where you can do it. So for instance, for coordinate sketches, you don't need to know strong convexity constant. Everything works with just these local uh, coordinate-wise Lipschitz constant is exactly the same thing here. So in that case, this thing will just go, and so on. Yeah, so you need to know the distributions. You, you, you can see that uh, some of these step, step size depends on the distribution of, of the sketches. So if you don't know this, then you cannot set the step size, right? But if you know it, then you can set it. So, so one way to think of this. If you can't evaluate that, can you put some attack on this, or is it better to use a previously existing method that doesn't introduce? So this is, so in, in, in general, this is hard to satisfy in the sense that it involves these expectations and so on, but, there is a choice and it works. In practice, you want to generate the sketches in such a way that first of all, uh, gamma can be as large as possible so that the rate is as big as possible. But you should also take into uh, consideration uh, the fact that you're compressing sketching so, so, so maybe you should take that in, into account. And in distributed optimization, that means the communication cost uh, has to be taken into account. If, Yes, yes. You would get the right one. You get the one over L for gradient ascent if, if, if you were if the sketch was deterministic. Okay, this would give you the right thing. Okay, it just looks uh, terrible because it's for any sketch. Okay. Okay, good. So this is the generic result. So here here is the result for coordinate uh, sketches, and we want to do this theory for for this sketch sketching matrix. So you take a random column submatrix of the identity matrix. Uh, where the columns are indexed by a random subset okay, of coordinates. And we allow any random subset. So all exponentially many subsets can have any probabilities. This is called arbitrary sampling. Uh, the state of the art randomized coordinates and methods are analyzed in the setting, which means you get an infinity of methods interpolating between single coordinates and, and gradient descent, and everything will have the right uh, rate. 
So special case of this would be gradient descent if you sample everything with probably one. Good, so in that case, uh, there is uh, this notion of a probability vector and probability matrix which are important because they show up in the complexities. Probability vector is just the probability that I coordinate is selected. And probability matrix is just this joint probability that both I and J are selected. And you put this thing into a matrix. And then it turns out there is this uh, uh, parameter called ESO vector, expected separate over, approxim over approximation vector, which is important because it said the step size is for randomized coordinate descent. And it's something that needs to satisfy this inequality. This is Hadamard product, and this is just diagonal matrix of, of these two things. So if, you're not so, if, you, if you haven't seen this before, don't worry about this. This is just a very brief introduction into this. Now it turns out that if you analyze SEGA and accelerate SEGA, which I didn't describe, you get exactly the same rate as the state-of-the-art randomized coincident methods, except you lose this factor of 8.5 and, and, and 10. Uh, the, without uh, this variance reduction that we do here, you have exactly these rates. There's no other constant hidden anywhere, except you don't have these constant in front of it. So now you have these constant in front of it. So, so what we see is that you have very different method, which uses exactly the same oracle. You have the same access to the same partial derivatives as randomized coordinate descent, but it's not a randomized coordinate descent method because, in fact, we are learning the gradient, so we're moving in, in, in potentially dense directions. Okay? We never move in random subspaces. And the rate is exactly the same up to a certain uh, uh, constant. Now, we don't think this constant is uh, improvable much because, in fact, we see that in practice this is also a little bit worse. Okay? Uh, okay, good. So you can see this is accelerated SEGA with important sampling. This is the best current rate for accelerated coordinate descent and we are 10 times worse with this algorithm. But it is known that uh, coincident algorithms cannot solve regularized problems with arbitrary regularizers. They need separable regularizers. This method doesn't. And the reason why it doesn't, because it actually builds approximation of the full gradient at the optimum, okay? So there's a trade-off there. Slightly slower rate by a factor of 10 or five or whatever, uh, or nine or 10, uh, but now you can solve uh, regularized problems. Good, so here's some literature on those randomized coincident methods we're comparing to. Now some experiments. First illustration on, in 2D, this is a funny algorithm. We use a, a ball constraint, so this is just a little cut of the ball constraint. We start from here, and ball constraint is not separable, so a coincident method will not solve this problem. The simple quadratic optimization with a ball constraint. So you can see that C, this red line, will just oscillate like this around the optimum, which is around there. But once you run uh, SEGA or by SEGA, we actually find the solution. You can see that this thing starts uh, working better and better. This is because the method does not move in random coordinate directions, but it builds the estimate, estimate of the gradient. So here is another picture how this looks like. Coordinate sent is the red line, clearly coordinate sent. And this method could work like this. It could oscillate like this, or it could, it could be going uh, um, on, on a much uh, more clear path. This is the biased version, this is the uh, unbiased version. It could also work like this, and you can already see that coordinate sent takes a certain number of steps, this takes more steps, and that's the factor of nine or whatever. Okay. You can actually see it there. We could compare with projected gradient ascent, uh, and, uh, and, and we could observe that, uh, that, uh, that as you do this, and depending on how much it is uh, tougher to compute uh, projected gradients and step, uh, we get uh, some improvements. Now, this is not a super important slide, so I'll go to uh, subspace uh, SEGA. So here, we use a very simple function, but now we're going to play with the fact that the gradient is in the subspace, and we're going to make a D much larger than N. We know that the gradient lives in, at most, N-dimensional space, but in fact, it's embedded into very huge dimensional D-dimensional space. Can we use that information? Yes, we run the subspace version of SEGA, and if you see that the uh, factor between the latent space, uh, which is n-dimensional, and the d-dimensional is two, the subspace SEGA is a little bit better than the naive, roughly twice. And uh, you can make uh, the difference arbitrarily large by uh, increasing the ratio. So this is 100 times better performance because the gradient lives in a 100 times smaller dimensional space than the original space. Okay. Good, so here we compare with uh, random direct search. Uh, you could approximate directional derivatives, random directional derivatives, by function values differences. So in some sense, uh, we can hack this algorithm a little bit 
and think of it as a derivative-free method. Okay? And when you then uh, compare against uh, some other derivative-free methods which also use uh, uh, the same information, we can see uh, that uh, this thing is uh, comparable and sometimes could be better. This is for uh, Gaussian sketches and coordinate sketches. Good. Now we compare against coordinate descent, and we see exactly what the theory says. Coordinate descent is faster than Sega. And there is a certain factor. And uh, so that is the factor of 10 or so. Same thing for acceleration. But of course, uh, now we could, in fact, go and apply this maybe to distributed optimization. And we can sparsify the gradients and the communication. So this thing will become uh, powerful if, in, in fact, uh, you don't care about time. So the summary is that we uh, develop here uh, the first variance reduction for uh, gradient compression, in this case for uh, sketches, for, for linear randomized uh, compression techniques. Uh, there's a bunch of algorithms, the basic SEGA, the bias version subspace accelerated SEGA. Uh, some of them we analyzed, not the biased one, but we analyzed subspace accelerated and SEGA. And in the case of coordinate sketches, where the algorithm is using exactly the same information about gradients as coordinate descent methods, we get exactly the same rates up to a factor of 10. Thank you. Yes? What was the comment about the deri making a, a derivative-free method? Right, so, uh, so if the sketch is just a vector, then, then, then the sketch really is a multiple uh, in a product between random vector and the gradient, which is directional derivative. And we can, we can approximate directional derivative by two function value differences divided by the distance. Okay. okay? Like yeah. Sorry, yeah. So we could, in fact, instead of whenever, wherever we're using the sketch, we can just substitute difference of two function values. Okay. Here at the current point, and a slightly perturbed in a random Gaussian, let's say, direction. Yeah. And this becomes a derivative free method. Now, we didn't do and analyze the error there. It could be done. It could be done, but we didn't uh, really bother with that. Uh, in that case, you can then compare it. It makes sense to compare it against other uh, derivative free methods, and it turns out it has a similar performance. But we didn't try to optimize over the sketches. We just compared against exactly the same sketches. More questions? Is that what other derivative free methods do? They just look in a bunch of random directions and then choose? So, so there's, a whole, there's a whole family of derivative free methods. There's this direct uh, search type derivative free methods, then there's a model based. We try to build a global model of function and always minimize the global model. Uh, but the simplest one that I know of is really based on just uh, uh, you're somewhere, you have a fixed set of directions. Uh, could be fixed. Uh, if it's fixed, then you just think of uh, a discrete distribution over those fixed many directions. You flip a coin, go in one direction, and ask yourself the question is the function of value quadratically smaller? than the step size from, 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 from the previous function value. Uh, if it is, you go there. If it's not, you have the step size. That's it. This works exactly the same thing as, 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 as gradient descent in the convex, strongly convex, non-convex case. So you get log 1 over epsilon, 1 over epsilon, 1 over epsilon squared rates in these cases, except you pay uh, a factor of dimension. OK, thank you. <laughs>